Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker for uh, this session of the IHER, the IHER Health Equity Seminar Series. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Thea James. Uh, Dr. James is a um, vice president of Mission Associates and the Chief Medical Officer and Co-Executive Director of the Health Equity Accelerator at Boston Medical Center. She's a professor of emergency medicine and director of the Violence Intervention Advocacy Program at BMC. She's a founding member of the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. In 2011, she was appointed to Attorney General Eric Holder's National Task Force on Children Exposed to Violence. Uh, Dr. James's passion has always been public health, both domestically and globally. Uh, she's a graduate of Georgetown University School of Medicine and trained in emergency medicine at Boston Medical Center, where she really has devoted her illustrious career uh, to improving the care delivered by that institution and the health of the communities that it serves. And so with that, I give you Dr. Thea James. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Richardson, for that generous um, introduction. I also want to say that um, I have to give a lot of credit to um, Dr. Richardson because you know, I, consider, I consider you a mentor. I remember going to national meetings and, you know, always like picking some time to like talk with you about something or you have breakfast with me or something. And so um, I, um, I count you among, uh, you know, my most important uh, mentors. And there were not that many, you know, when we were coming up. So um, probably for me, maybe two <laughs> with you being one of them. So thank you so much. So today, you know, um, I basically sort of wanted to talk about, um, I'm sharing my screen now. I basically wanted to um, talk with you about um, operationalizing health equity. You know, you hear so many people talking about equity, you know, health equity and following sort of the, um, uh, everything, the reckoning that was happening in our country in 2020 and the pandemic and, you know, these two things um, combined, you know, you heard lots of people sort of, um, talking about equity or people coming out and making statements and commitments about equity. And I actually thought that it was um, a fascinating time. And I also was a little curious because I found it interesting that people were quickly making commitments to equity. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of thought it would be difficult to learn something so quickly and learn something overnight. I knew that there was a lot of historic uh, knowledge that you know one would have to gain, you know, to actually do uh, make these commitments and to actually execute on them. So, what I want to share with you today is how we sort of did it at our hospital, and um, I think I want to begin with telling you just a little bit about um, our hospital. So, I'm going to start here, and then I'll go back a slide. So um, our hospital is what is deemed um, a safety net hospital. Today, these hospitals in America are called America's Essential Hospital. And our hospital is kind of interesting. I mean, it is a hospital where a majority of our patients come from disinvested communities. Um, and uh, a majority of our patients are government insured with two thirds being Medicaid. We even have a health plan. And uh, in terms of Medicaid in Massachusetts, uh, you, we have something, our Medicaid is now uh, an accountable care organization. You know, it, 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 it focuses on value-based care where the, uh, the hospitals actually take responsibility for the patients. So for example, um, Medicaid had been, the cost of Medicaid had been going up in Massachusetts for about a decade. And in 2018, Medicaid said, you know, we're no longer going to pay you on a fee-for-service model. If your patients come in 25 times a year, admitted 25 times a year, we're no longer going to pay you for every time you bill us for something. Uh, you know, you're going to get um, you, you're going to get 
money, but you're going to be charged with uh, uh, improving health outcomes and lowering costs. And we want you to achieve that by focusing on determinants of health. So since 2018, we've been in that uh, reimbursement model. Um, seven in 10 of our patients identify as, as BIPOC patients. Um, uh, and we are a teaching hospital as well. Our affiliate hospital is Boston University School of Medicine. We deliver about 3,000 babies um, a year and uh, one in seven births in Massachusetts, um, uh, one in seven black births in Massachusetts are born at our hospital. As you can see, one in 13 uh, Hispanic births uh, and one in 100 white births in Massachusetts occur at our hospital. We are also New England's largest safety net hospital. And we're also in the top 20 of um, uh, institutions or medical institutions that receive NIH funding. And then when I was telling you about mass health, our patients are 40% of mass health in Massachusetts. And uh, that encompasses all the other health systems that fall under our hospital as an accountable care organization. It's kind of complicated, but do know that we are responsible for 40% of the lives, um, the Medicaid lives in Massachusetts. So that being said, I want to I want to share. Let's see, is it going to work? Let's see if it's going to work. Okay, I'm going in the wrong direction. Here we go. So that you know, that being said, we've always sort of you know had our eye on the gaps that our patients have in their lives, you know, and so we've always been doing things that are innovative to fill the gaps. Like we have. <clears throat> Um, a food pantry, for example, a prescription food pantry. We and we also have like a, a rooftop garden that sort of uh, serves our cafeteria. Um, it serves the food pantry as well. We also sometimes have a farmers market of from all the products that are grown on the in, in, on the uh, on the rooftop deck. We also have a grow clinic for kids who are um, uh, under underweight and that type of thing. When they're born, we can follow them for many years. We have something called a medical legal partnership. We call it MLP Boston now because it's disseminated across the country. We have the violence intervention program that uh, Lynn was mentioning. We were founding members of the uh, Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. We started off with six hospitals. We now have, I guess, 49 or so across the country. We have street cred. You know, we um, uh, do taxes in, in, in the pediatrics clinic so that people can access um, earned income tax credit. So lots of things we've been doing at Children's Health Watch is a big um, uh, policy group that does a lot of research. So we've always been doing these things to sort of like fill gaps people had, but not necessarily to eliminate the gaps people have. So when you're just filling gaps, it doesn't enable people to change their, life's, um, their life course. They just stay right there. And if you take those gap fillers away, then people sort of don't thrive. And so I think what 2020 did for us was to make us, you know, start to um, interrogate this a little bit and think about it in a different way. And so even we, though we were doing all these things prior to 2020, these data, it, it, this never changes. It's always the same. And I would say for all of you who are on this call, um, it's no surprise. It's highly predictable. I mean, no matter what you measure, you can me measure pretty much anything and you really already know who's going to do worse. Yet a lot of people have studied, you know, these disparities. And I, I think the, the biggest body of work, and that was done in 2003 with unequal treatment. But when, this, I mean, it, it, nothing really changes. And so what we decided to do in 2020, instead of coming out with a statement or a commitment around equity, we decided to look into our own house. You know, we wanted to look inside the entire enterprise, including education, research, human resources, um, all of the clinical areas, ambulatory care, you know, inpatient, everything to look for disparities. And for sure, we found them, but we didn't look for them just to look for them. We looked for them with an intentionality to close the gaps. The first thing we did was to establish um, uh, some, some uh, rules of engagement, for example, you know, and we, and what that meant was that there would be no blaming and no shaming around these, these gaps that we found, but that we would help each other, learn from each other and support each other in the work to actually close the gaps. 
The CEO and the COO drove this entire thing. They divided us up into six work groups that, um, actually seven work groups, but two of them were collapsed. It's really six, but two of these were collapsed. And uh, we were um, uh, charged to come up with up to three gaps that were found and all those, all the data was put in box. And uh, we had to come up with two to, or up to three things that gaps that we were going to close in the next 12 to 24 months. That was, it was highly, um, pe uh, you know, there were lots of eyes on it. We had big Zooms every month where people were reporting on what they had proposed and um, where they were advancing um, on the work. And in order to, whatever you proposed had to be uh, vetted by the CEO and the COO. It could not look like anything we'd ever done before. It had to have an intentionality to close a gap. And so that's where um, our journey sort of started in actually 2021. And so this is what those six you know, work groups look like. And these are uh, some of the pieces that fit into each of the work groups. And I want you to note um, <clears throat> for uh, number five and number three, you see the dollar sign in there. Because you know we recognize that the root cause of all of these things, quite frankly, is um, economics. I mean, people are trying to, you know, our patients have limited resources and they are making decisions between how they use those resources. Do they use them for health or do they use them for survival? And for them, it's, you know, it's a no brainer. I mean, the limited resources they have are going to first go towards um, things like housing and things like feeding your family and paying your utilities. Um, things, you know, using the money for transportation or, or to buy some special foods or whatever for disease. It just, it, it's not even on, on the table. And, you know, meanwhile, people's health just continues to spiral out of control and they just come back in and over and over and over again. And so we focus on economic mobility for our patients as well. And I'll, you know, I'll give um, an example of that um, in a, you know, in, in a few minutes. And so these are some of the things that fall under some of the bodies of work that fall under the six work groups. And um, I won't, you know, go through all of them, but I'm presenting this just as an example for you to see the types of things we were working on and the types of things that people chose um, to uh, be responsible for closing in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. And this again was in 2021. And so one of the first things we found because our OBGYN department was actually doing a, a quality improvement uh, uh, work, uh, some quality improvement work, they found that um, uh, there was a, a difference in postpartum hemorrhage between black women and white women in pregnancy. And uh, we decided that the methodology, well, they decided the way that they would go about trying to close the gap and try to understand what this particular disparity was about would be to interrogate the data. And so the first thing that they discovered in interrogating the data is that this was mostly associated with preeclampsia. And they also knew that, you know, the treatment for preeclampsia was to, you know, deliver the baby. And then they interrogated the data more and saw that, um, you know, the, the, the quicker that decision was made, like to go to C-section, the less likely, um, uh, you know, a, a bad outcome was to happen. And they interrogated the data again and saw that the providers were taking twice as long to make that decision in Black women. And so one of the things they did immediately was to standardize the decision-making process. And they, they, they removed the, the um, subjectivity uh, from the decision-making process. So they could alleviate the variability in that decision-making process. And guess what? That gap closed just by doing that immediately. At the exact same time, they started to sort of uh, dig around to understand context for that variability in decision-making. So uh, they interviewed many, many patients, they interviewed providers, nurse practitioners, everyone who was involved in, in the process. And you know, they learned many things. And I'll say that, you know, we continue to have these, these Zooms every month and the people began to, the people who were studying this 
began to make slides with some of the quotes that patients would make on the slides. And sometimes the Zoom meetings would be just totally silent, you know, because people for, were really, really surprised at what they what they read, uh, some of the quotes from, from patients. You know, these, these things were like, you know, somewhat surprising for, for some people. Um, and in interviewing the patients, the intentionality of that, and that's another word I think that's so important in this whole thing is intentionality. There was an intentionality to close a gap. And in order to, under, to, to be able to do that, you have to understand the root cause. And so you have to like interrogate um, all the data to get to root cause. So I think intentionality is a, an important word these days because oftentimes, you know, as I was saying, and I've seen this quote in health affairs before, you know, structural racism is so powerful until it looks normal. You know, it looks normal to people. So they don't recognize it even when they're looking right at it or, you know, oftentimes complicit in it. They don't recognize it because it looks normal. It's the status quo. And in health affairs, I, I read that uh, someone uh, someone's quote said that structural racism is deemed to or, or assumed to be the natural order of things. Like it's inevitable, you know, that this will happen. And so uh, you have to have an intentionality to to do something different and want to know something different. And so because we took, they took that step, the OBGYN department took that step in sort of uh, closing that particular gap. We then decided in October of 2021, decided we got in a room for two days and tried to figure out what we were going to do to operationalize this across the institution. Uh, going forward. And we came up with uh, a name called Health Equity Accelerator. And the word accelerator really means that we're going to do everything we can do fast and quickly, like they did with changing the decision-making process or standardizing it. And then also, um, you know, do qualitative work at the exact same time. And so when we started, there were just the three of us, um, Elena Mendez Escobar, and myself, we're co-directors of this um, Health Equity Accelerator. Petrina Martin Cherry is our um, community engagement or vice president of community engagement and external affairs. I've never seen anybody do the job the way she does it. That's another entire talk, but uh, she started that entire thing with COVID. And uh, one of the models that she used with COVID, which is how we do everything now, which is why we interviewed all these patients, um, is when we're trying to solve something now, these days, we start with the community or we start with the patients. She has uh, an equity um, partnership network of um, various different community members, community leaders. She has, uh, it's about 100 people and they all have various different, if you think of a pie and you slice the pie, each group works on various different topics that we're doing in the hospital. And before we, you know, we, do almost anything we're trying to address, we go to them first. We did that with COVID. I don't wanna go into that right now, but that helped us. We asked the patients, um, where should the sites be? What would it take for them to be willing to take the vaccine? And we were able to vaccinate that population at four and a half times our state was able to do. Again, intentionality to address that particular population. So we had this big equity oversight group, all these people over here, either chiefs of departments, or C-suite people. So that's how we started out with that relatively um, skeleton crew. And these are the um, uh, five verticals is what we call them, the things that we are working on and the enablers, you know, for those verticals. As you can see, um, everything's labeled here, you know, education, advocacy, culture, community data, all these various different things. I will say um, again, this was October, 2021 and uh, this right here is blurred because when we used to, when we first started out, we were, you know, going on the road and everything. We, I don't know, we were less willing to share <laughs> uh, this dashboard. But as I was saying, the, there was a lot of accountability involved in this process. And uh, this is the dashboard that was shown every month when people were reporting on their work. And I'm happy to say, um, you know, this was in 2022 in terms of what the dashboard looks like today. Um, most things are green and, and well on their way or have been accomplished. This is what that skeleton crew has grown to uh, 
uh, from 2021 to 2022. We've hired a lot of people to fill all these um, boxes to actually do the work that we set out to do um, in the beginning. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I didn't turn off my email, I should have. Also, we've um, populated these verticals as well. So I'll explain a little bit to you in terms of what we've done um, with the equity and pregnancy and how, how, how interviewing the patients and asking them to work with us for solutions beyond closing, beyond changing the um, um, decision-making process. I'll, I'll show you some outcomes from that. But you know, we've discovered so many things from talking to so many people. Um, we've, the, a lot of these data right now are old, to tell you the truth. Um, these numbers are actually much higher. But one of the things we're happy about is we created, um, we, give, we give grants out, uh, seed grants within internal seed grants. And it took a while for people to understand what the health equity accelerator was what its intentionality was. Because oftentimes people would present research proposals that were the same as before. You know, they were trying to identify a gap that they knew already knew existed, but with no intentionality or nothing in the proposal that uh, had an intent to close the gap. So these people would not get funded, <coughs> excuse me. And it took around, I think it took like three rounds, three or four rounds. And we started having office hours to give people feedback. And then they started to present or uh, propose uh, grants that uh, you know we were intending to that were intending to close gaps, and now they they all have it very very easily. We also have equity fellows um, now. We're we're about to interview our third round of um, equity fellows as well. So it's been um, it's been rapid, it's been fast, it's been accelerated, but it's um, it's actually doing. I, I think we've actually exceeded our expectations. Oh, one other thing I wanted to look at. So under SDOH, where you see 600 jobs at Boston Medical Center. So in the beginning, we had a JP Morgan Chase grant for $5 million. And it was based on community revitalization and economic mobility. We were uh, creating pipelines of living wage jobs, living wage paying jobs from seven zip codes that we serve into jobs at BMC and specific around living wage paying jobs. And in that first year, instead of getting 52 people, we wound up hiring 600. We are right now up to 978. And we also have some internal work that moves people from say, it's um, professional development, it's really intense. It's about six months long and um, people can interview for different jobs. For example, you might move from someone who's in environmental services might become a manager in radiology or in the breast clinic or something like that. And <clears throat> that's part of what I was just talking about um, right there. And now I'll tell you a little bit about one year later in October, 2022, what all of the work and the interviews and uh, you know talking with the patients and collaborating with the patients, partnering with the patients, what some of that work was like and what it has um, led to. So one of the things we're doing is remote uh, blood pressure monitoring because a lot of patients just like could not come to the hospital every time they felt different or felt something. Um, some of, sometimes these things led to some of these um, poor outcomes in pregnancy. Sometimes it led to death. Different types of things, you know, happened. Um, so now all of our patients are uh, monitored 24 seven. There is a nurse watching everybody's blood pressure around the clock. And when something is um, suspected or suspicious, the patient's contacted. If we think they need to come in, you know, we're able to, to bring them in. Um, the patients, we also have doulas. I'm gonna speak a little bit more on that in a second. Um, the patients also said they wanted a chat box because they say they had lots of questions, you know, during pregnancy that they wish they could reach somebody quickly to ask and they were not able to do that. And so they, um, we co-created a chatbot with them. They gave us a list of questions they, that they would want at, um, to ask and we uh, built that into the chatbot. They also wanted more education around sort of like uh, preeclampsia, for example. So we co-created educational videos with them. And if you saw one, you would recognize that it is definitely um, patient-centered and, and patient-created. 
Um, and we're also doing some work on dismantling obstetric racism. And uh, that entails, you know, addressing department climate and culture, which is not easy, by the way, as you can imagine. Um, I'm going to through that one. So this sort of uh, busy, busy diagram over here is just showing the various different types of uh, things that were found when they, when the, when the OBGYN doctors or, or not, not the doctors, but the people on the quality improvement project were interrogating data. When they were interrogating the data, um, these are the type of things that came out of the interrogation. And it's kind of uh, complicated. And, you know, if you look at it, you know, it looks like a, you know, a lot of arrows going in various different uh, directions but it was very, 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 in help, very, very helpful. And uh, <clears throat> essentially, I don't wanna go through reading this story, but essentially this is uh, a patient um, who had previously had um, a, a bad outcome uh, with, a, with, a, with a baby and you know, she had a stillbirth um, associated with preeclampsia, but this time around, she actually um, had a, a normal birth. Um, this is the chat bot I was telling you about. And I'll, I'll be able to share these slides with you if you want to see them afterward. Um, and this uh, is a, an example of the, um, the, the, uh, the video. And so, um, you know, the, the, the research that was being done around this quality improvement project was just really, you know, focusing on how to develop, you know, what to develop, how to implement it, and also assessment of it all. And um, uh, I mean, the person who led this work is a qualitative researcher um, by training. She's excellent in this work. This right here is uh, what has happened in a year um, from all this work you know, from the chatbot, from the educational videos, from interviewing the patients, from the blood pressure monitoring, our postpartum readmission rates for hypertension have gone down significantly just in one year. So when you hear people say things like, people look at data that's so predictable, you already know who's gonna do worse and people, and you try and you present an opportunity to, or, or an idea to address it, and change it and you know, mitigate it. People say things like you can't boil the ocean. You can't listen to people who say things like that, you know, because that just is self-perpetuating. It just self-perpetuates. You think you can't do it, you set low bars and become self-fulfilling prophecies. And this is these are these are this is some information about um, our doulas. And as you can see, these numbers are really impression, impressive in terms of what happens when you have. Um, a doula. It's a person, you know, who you can relate to, who you can call on at any time, who's going through, walking through the pregnancy with you um, from start to finish or beginning to end. Um, as you can see, you know, the rate of cesarean, uh, cesareans, uh, C-sections as, you know, the difference is 28% versus 41%. Uh, more people are interested in breastfeeding. Um, fewer uh, NICU admissions. I mean, I don't need to like read them slide uh, line by line, but as you can see, having doulas really makes a difference. And it's actually about having someone you're comfortable with, you know, having someone you can establish a rapport with, having someone who you trust. And I think in terms of like hospitals and health systems, you know, we are insular, you know, we're quite insular, we're quite rigid. And, you know, the last thing we would think about to get to answer, to understand why something is happening is to ask the people it's happening to. And I learned it as an ER resident, as an ER attending. I mean, seeing patients coming in repeatedly and in many cases, literally the same patients with the same problems, always out of control. Eventually I started asking people, what would it take for this not to happen again? And that's when I learned all the various different things that were that patients were prioritizing over health, which made perfect sense to me. 
in my mind, they were making very rational decisions. And so all of my discharge instructions always began there. My workup began there. Because if I just give them what the computer spits out for each diagnosis, um, I don't give myself an opportunity to like really help this patient. And I think this exact same thing about when we're trying to change data and things like that, we don't give ourselves an opportunity uh, to have the greatest chance of, of you know, being impactful at all because we don't know what people need, only they know. And so it's best to, to start there. And besides, it's easier, it's much easier. Everything has been very rigorous in terms of like accountability and timelines and things like that. And this here is just like an example of, you know, what the launch dates were like and, uh, you know, what the various different um, timelines uh, were for all these various different programs on the left-hand side. And now I just want to talk a little bit about some intentionality that we've done around um, economic mobility, for example. We've done it from internally. I gave an example of bringing patients from zip codes we serve into living wage jobs because the intent is to alter life course trajectory by um, enabling people to switch socioeconomic lanes. And uh, this 82 bed facility is in Brockton, which is probably about, I don't know, 20 minutes from our hospital maybe um, with not a lot of traffic. And um, this is a um, hospital for uh, behavioral health. And um, we intentionally looked for a BIPOC developer to build, um, you know, to build out this place. It's also net zero carbon emissions. Um, the entire staff, you know, almost the entire staff, maybe 90% um, are BIPOC um, uh, residents, but we also hire most of those people from that particular location, that geographic area um, to, to work in this place. And um, that has been a great success for us as well. I think what might be useful um, to say to you is that we joined something called the Healthcare Anchor Network back in probably 2017 or 2018 when it first started. And the intent of the Healthcare Anchor Network is uh, to build more inclusive, sustainable local economies. Again, we're addressing the root of everything you know, um, economics. And um, the way that that happens is hospitals are able to address that by being intentional about how they make decisions in hiring, investment, and procurement. And so we have an internal healthcare anchor network as well that meets um, every month. And each of those areas is led by someone. So we look at the data on hires, how many people we've hired, where those people have tracked into. Um, we have lots of um, benchmarks and things associated uh, with, with these data. Um, we ch we ch check investments, you know, we do investments in um, small businesses in the community. And, uh, and I'll give you an example of what that looks like and what the intent was and, and how we were actually able um, to do that. And in procurement, exact same thing. We look for vendors who are minorities, women, people with disabilities as well. And we track the data on that every single, and that's a report out as well um, every, every single month. And so this is an example of how we invest in the community. So in Massachusetts, when you build onto your facility, if you add a new wing, even if you get a new MRI, the state says you have to give 5% of the total cost, uh, construction cost or cost of the equipment to the community. And whatever you propose, the state has to approve it. And in 2017, we had just completed um, campus redesign and uh, we had six and a half million dollars to spend. Now, I don't know if that sounds like a little or a lot, but I can tell you compared to the other hospitals in town, it was a little. Children's Hospital, for example, Children's Hospital of Boston, at the exact same time, they had one of uh, these obligations. It's actually called determination of need. And they had 53.4 million to spend on the community compared to our six and a half million. Mass General Brigham right now has one for 69 million. 
And so what we did at that time was um, ask the state if we could commit our six and a half million to multiple different housing initiatives, and it was approved. One of the things we invested in is this housing development right there. And the reason we did it is because um, to get funded for it, the developers would have to be building something that provided access to um, affordable housing, green walking space, transit, healthy, affordable food. And that was aligned with our values. And so we gave them a $1 million no interest loan plus some operating capital, like 400,000. Now, the reason we did that is because banks will come into a community like that. And the only way they will fund you is that is by, you know, giving you a loan with really high um, interest rates associated with it and a rapid time to pay back the loan, which is um, one of the main reasons why a business will open and soon close in, in a community like that. So we did that. We call that patient capital. And we did that to sort of buffer people from, you know, the, you know, the, the owners from uh, having to close their doors. Now, Good Food Markets was based in D.C., the owners, but, you know, they were going to uh, operate this store and own it, quite frankly. They built out the store, but it never opened because COVID happened. And when the pandemic happened, they said, we can't travel. We'll have to give you local operators. And we, they introduced us to two operators who were two um, gentlemen, uh, one, one, one African-American guy and, and an Eritrean. And they were both um, uh, entrepreneurs. They already had businesses and things. They were well uh, educated and experienced. And um, they were not interested in being operators. They wanted to own the business and they wanted to own the physical space because that's how you achieve generational wealth building. And they uh, were interested in, in providing equity stock ownership to their um, uh, employees. And so obviously we had to change uh, the structure of the original loan. And it took us 16 months of sort of banging on the desk with the other people invested in that capital stack of, of, uh, of investors, but we finally, um, they gave in finally. And so they now own that. Um, and it's called um, Nubian Markets. I'll show that to you in a second. But the other thing I want to say is um, the hospitals in Boston, you know, in the United States, you have to do a community health needs assessment every three years. Um, and uh, in 2019, the hospitals in Boston did one together. And so uh, we've done a third one, I mean, a second one already. And I'm saying this to say that we are now partners. Sometimes we invest together. Uh, we do gap funding and other businesses in the community, all types of stuff. Uh, you know, some hospitals are independently investing in, uh, you know, different types of buildings and all kinds of things. So the patients who come through the doors, they're in the state they're in with, you know, because of all these, you know, structural barriers to the, them being able to achieve at their highest levels, but they come from some place you know, these, these disinvested communities. And I don't want to start talking about redlining because that'll be another 15 minutes added on to this. But, you know, the greatest impact of redlining in the 1930s was um, economic exclusion. And so, uh, and that has been self-perpetuating. So um, anyway, um, that's an example of it. So this is what Nubian Markets um, looks like today. It recently had a grand opening with the mayor and elected officials in state government, lots of people were there um, to, to visit it. The food is better, even better, it tastes even better than it looks. It's like unbelievable. Um, and so these are just some examples of things we invest in, community land trust, city fresh foods, um, all kinds of things that we invest in. Uh, this is some of the community work that Trina and her team, they go to, they, they work seven days a week. All, I mean, they're doing various different things. We're on Martha's Vineyard for one, two, three, the third or fourth time this year. This time we have a series of talks on things like mental health and uh, economic mobility, um, equity and pregnancy, diabetes, and to get a coveted spot um, at, at the um, Union Church there is a really, really big deal in August uh, on the vineyard. So that's been great um, for us. and. In that one year's time between 21 and 22, we actually got a, three publications out. We got one in the New England Journal, and that was about the Health Equity Accelerator in the in Catalyst. And, uh, and then our um, CEO um, wrote 
no, actually hers is not even on here. Uh, we wrote something in the nonprofit quarterly about why safety net um, hospitals should be focusing on wealth creation in the communities we serve. And then our approach to um, COVID that I shared a little bit about um, this with you on. This is the piece that our um, CEO wrote. And uh, there were five, she was basically ending with five lessons that she's learned in since like 2020, 2021. And, you know, these are the five, you know, like wealth is health. Uh, and again, you know, people making hard choices about what they do with the resources. Time is luxury. In other words, you know, we should uh, be making our um, services and access available to, to patients because, again, they're making the same kind of rational decisions about what they can prioritize and not based on how many things they have to prioritize before help. Um, patients have agency. We should allow them to make choices. We should allow them to, um, you know, determine what's best for them. Um, and one of the things we found in our diabetes vertical, which is behind uh, the um, equity and pregnancy vertical. When I say behind, we started that work after that work, after the equity and pregnancy work. One of the things we found uh, in multiple areas actually is that delayed diagnosis and, and of course treatment if you haven't noted, if you haven't diagnosed it in um, uh, patients of color. And also this whole notion that um, you know averages are blind, you know, whereas something like um, prostate cancer uh, may, you know, have lower rates um, uh, for, uh, for, for white men, you know, for black men, you know, it rises to the top. And so we have to not use these sort of blind averages when we're thinking about our patients, you know, we have to um, uh, do the data to understand and actually be aware of what their risks are um, compared to other people. And uh, last thing I'll say is um, actually um, the Joint Commission, everybody I think knows who the Joint Commission uh, is. It, it, you know, it accredits all the health systems in, 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 in America. They actually came to our hospital and interviewed us and talked to us and they actually like uh, put us on their website um, as an example of um, um, you know, how to operationalize equity. So uh, that was, you know, we were we were happy about that. That happened in uh, 2022. So I think that's um, the last slide I have here. And uh, I want to open it up to, or folks, I guess, um, uh, leave it up to, to everyone here. I know that was so long. Much. Thank you so much for that. The uh, doc Dr. Utsakatri actually is going to um, oversee our Q and A session. And for those of you who are listening, uh, you can type your questions into the Q and A. My apologies, I should have told you that early on. Um, but if you have questions for Dr. James or comments, uh, please type them into the Q and A feature on the webinar. Uh, and we will have her address as many of them uh, as we can. So Dr. Khatri, take it away. Thank you. And thanks for that fantastic talk, Dr. James. Um, waiting for some questions to come in. And um, as they do, I'll start with a question that I had in listening to your talk. Um, you know, it, it's my impression that uh, people who work at safety net hospitals um, at all levels, at every job that they're doing are a very special bunch uh, who are incredibly mission driven and mission focused. And I'm wondering, um, you know, from your from your level and your perspective, uh, what um, which of the many um, principles and interventions are applicable to non-safety net um, hospitals and health systems, whether they're academic or community-based um, um, health systems, and which may be more challenging to translate in those spaces. You're, you're on mute, Dr. James. All of them are applicable because the people are the people, you know, no matter what. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say, you know, the principle is like beginning, you know, with the person and, um, uh, you know, finding out what's most important to them, you know, and what matters most to them. And uh, the challenges are, I would say the greatest challenge is organizational culture. 
I mean, when I talk to, I mean, we're the only safety net in, in Boston. So, I mean, the Brigham, Mass General, like all of these other hospitals, I mean, um, we work together. And I will tell you from my, you know, my work, I mean, we populate each other's community advisory boards and all this stuff. So we really work together. But um, the greatest challenges to my colleagues is organizational culture. Um, you know, before, if they propose to do something like what we've done, for example, first of all, nobody, most people won't allow themselves to be vulnerable. You know, actually like looking at the data, you know, looking at what we found. Most people, you know, are not willing to allow themselves to be vulnerable. And it's not a, it's not a criticism. I mean, I guess, it's hard, you know, but we were willing to be transparent about what we found because we weren't going to leave it there. And I think some people believe that, again, they will say you can't boil the ocean. Actually, a, a colleague of mine told me that today. I was on a panel earlier and she was sharing with me. She goes, yeah, when I try to talk to people about this and this person has a big job um, in DE&I and that type of thing, she's told that, well, you know, you need to have... Um, you know, you have, have to have these evidence-based um, things and, um, you know, you can't boil the ocean and all these other things. They don't, they hire people to do these jobs and then they don't allow them to do the job. But I will say that the people who are in our various different hospitals, um, when they are experiencing, unless they are financially, and even when they are financially well off, when they're out in the world, you have, we have the same experiences, you know, because people, I mean, you know, there's a dominant narrative about who you are, what you're capable of, you know, um, what you do, all these various different things. And, you know, the experiences are, uh, can be very similar, but I would say that it's applicable to all hospitals. It does not matter, you Thank know, you. what the population is. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Dr. Cheryl Heron, who says, Dr. James, thank you as always. Can you speak a bit to your priority strategies to bring along the slow adopters? Metrics are key and buy-in even more so. Given the politics of today, welcome your insight. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, 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 uh, if folks, you know, are, so let me take, you know, I'll give a perfect example. The thing about a safety net hospital is, you know, it's, it's a trap in many ways, because if the majority of people that you see coming in all the time are, you know, of a certain ilk, you know, they come from a, a you know, disinvested communities, everybody, and these are well-meaning mission-driven people, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily understand why those people are like that or how they got there. You know, again, it looks normal to them, right? And so I was, I would say that, you know, we knew people had gaps, but we didn't understand that we didn't have any historic knowledge about that. And I remember how it kind of started was um, us having like a big town hall kind of a thing. And I remember I just I had just gotten in this job and I just started talking about um, redlining, <laughs> for example. And I was I was speaking about it in response to us planning to do some things, yet another plan to change what we were seeing over and over and over again. You know, it's like a, 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 a different way to solve a problem. And people were talking about creating a pathway to maybe something like be able to provide more people access to food stamps. And in my mind, I was asking, why not use that energy and those resources to uh, provide something that makes it so people don't need food stamps? And I started out like with those kinds of things, you know, um, that, that maybe we hadn't thought about before. But in order to get people to see that more, I had to talk about redlining just so they could understand you know, that that was something that was done to address an economic disaster after the Great Depression of 1929. You know, when FDR was trying to resuscitate our country from that economic disaster and creating pathways for people to build wealth through home ownership and paying 
developers to even build more houses so more people would have access to um, home uh, owning homes. As that's still the most common way of building wealth in this country. But he would subsidize these developers only if they agreed not to sell them to Black people. And so right then and there, you know, you sort of create these two distinct socioeconomic pathways. And it is self-perpetuating, once again, exists to this day. Redlining maps across America match COVID maps across America, you know, just to show how self-perpetuating that is. And so, I mean, I guess people began to like, you know, listen to it and, you know, try to understand it. But I have a, a lot of colleagues who don't have an opportunity to do that, you know. And when they had, you know, on these Zooms, I, I actually I started talking out loud about, I know there are other black and brown colleagues here on the Zoom or in this room. And um, I, I'm talking about this now for the first time. I was vulnerable. This first time um, I would tell them things like, up to now I've been using euphemisms to avoid the third rail, the words that would upset people and things like that, that would make it so that they would shut down and not hear you. So I felt it was good to give examples, you know, historic examples that people could vet. It's right there. You can look it up any place and, and hoping that it would begin to make sense. And that's kind of like how it started in terms of answering um, Dr. Heron's question. Thank you. Um, there is uh, there are a few questions about the work that you led in the um, OB space in particular, um, questions about if there were any regulatory um, red tape uh, with partnering with the doulas. Um, did you interface with midwives where the doula is hired by the hospital? People want to know more about this. Yeah, we've actually had them since 1999. And, you know, what we've done is quadrupled the size now. Um, but, yeah, the hospital, the hospital um, hired them. And, uh, you know, they do, I mean, they do work, you know, institutionally with um, uh, nurse practitioners. Now, you said nurse practitioners or did you say midwives? You said midwives. Right. Midwives, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they are there and among that uh, group of um, providers as well. But... The, you know, the doulas are the ones that, you know, follow them outside the hospital and, you know, are on, you can, they can call and contact like 24 seven and about anything, more things than pregnancy. I mean, all the other various different things that go on in a person's life um, that go on in a person's life that impact and can impact um, pregnancy. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions, if that's okay with you, Dr. James. Sure. Um, there's one question um, that says, could you discuss potential methods for changing organizational culture to benefit equity? Yeah, if they allow you to speak at all, you know, if they allow you to speak, um, maybe start one person at a time you know, find some people who are likely to be allies, you know, um, that you can have these conversations with. Maybe show them, although I don't know, um, well, maybe show them some examples. Actually, you could probably do it through uh, community voices. You know, every hospital has some kind of like, you know, community engagement uh, person. Well, I shouldn't say every hospital, but many of them do. And um, if you can, uh, everybody, doesn't everybody have a patient family, a PFAC patient family advisory council or something? I mean, you can begin by having conversations with those folks and, you know, the hospital wants to hear from them, but it takes a lot of coaxing. Listen, I, like I said, I've been yeah, using euphemisms for like my entire career, starting with the violence intervention program which I would say has been a proof of concept for me because those young kids who come in with um, gunshot wounds, um, who people think are bad people, you know, because they have gunshot wounds and, you know, they're generally uh, brown and black. And we set really high bars for those young kids because we realized that they were um, hopeless and the tattoos said it all, but they are now like, you know, some of them go into the trades, they have college degrees, uh, graduate degrees, they're entrepreneurs, you know, all kinds of things. They own buildings, 
you know, all kinds of things that no one ever thought was possible for them. So um, that's how I knew this was possible for all of our patients, anyone, everybody. Um, but you have to keep trying. And I'm saying this to say that, you know, I never thought I would see what I'm seeing right now today in Boston. And I'm just telling you a little bit about it. I'm just talking about equity from this perspective, but you know, we have something called the Health Equity Compact. It's about 70 Black and, and, and Hispanic leaders of things. I've never seen so many like CEOs of things and um, senior VPs of things. I mean, and they focus a lot on policy and, you know, by the way, my CEO is now um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the new governor <laughs> in our state. And I can already see her influence in that. And so again, what I'm saying is that you just keep trying, you use some emotional intelligence around what will get people's attention, what they're ready to hear, you know, what they could hear, and um, you know, get some patient voices in there because you know, you can't ignore that. The only way to ignore it is not allow it to begin with. But if you can get it to begin with, you can, I feel like you can begin to change it, you know, but I, I never gave up on it. And mainly because I was achieving it with a small cohort, you know, the, the victims of violence and seeing change and watching that grow into a national organization now called the Hobby Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. And I know this is off, out of con, off topic, but it's not out of um, context. Like Kaiser just paid the Javi $24 million to create a center based upon what we're doing to, to alter life course trajectory for these young people, doing exactly what we're talking about now in terms of approaching it through equity. But just don't give up, you know, don't, don't, don't give up. It's hard to live with. It's just, it's just hard to live with. So. That's what I would say. And don't listen to people about you can't boil the ocean. It's just, just don't, don't listen to that. That's just going to stifle you and your dreams and what you know is possible. And that would translate to so many other people's lives you could change. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering our questions, um, for your incredible talk, um, for just being such an inspiring advocate and leader in the space. I told Dr. James this before we started, but I still remember our seven minutes meeting when I was a medical student uh, interviewing for emergency medicine residencies. And I, you know, it's rare that you meet someone for just a few minutes and spend your whole career wondering how you can channel their passion and energy and intelligence and dedication. And um, Dr. James, you really are so, so inspiring. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. No, thank you for your kind words. I, I, I somehow feel like, you know, I, 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 I hope I was helpful. You know, I hope I was helpful. I feel like, you know, I could have shared even, you know, more and, I, you know, examples and things, but I, um, I hope you got the, you know, you, 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 you got what I was trying to uh, convey, you know, to you and what's possible and that you can do it. You just have to just like, not listen to the naysayers. We did. We did. And we will have you back for part two. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'll be happy to come back. All right. Um, Dr. Richardson, did you want to close us out? Uh, just to say thank you to Dr. James and thank you to all of our attendees for your engagement. I, I think it's really important to hear from uh, really inspiring leaders like Dr. James uh, who show us what is possible uh, and what you can achieve if you just don't give up, if you just keep doing the work and growing the things, the interventions that make a difference and going to the root causes, not just putting Band-Aids on the symptoms. Uh, many things are possible. And I, I think this is exactly the kind of work that our Institute for Health Equity Research is also committed to. So it's wonderful to hear what you've accomplished in Boston. and. Uh, we will uh, we will stay in touch to talk about what we can do together. Please, I would love that. Would love it. Absolutely love it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Carol, Utsa, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bye, Cheryl. <laughs>